Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Now one of the key points of discussion over the last few weeks has been one of the All Blacks squad, but also the All Blacks 15 squad and what that means for the branding, the All Blacks brand, for the development of New Zealand rugby players and also for the players who didn't make either squad. Having 70 players who are considered the best in the country, does that say to the people who thought they were on the fringes but weren't, maybe it's time to go. We've got one of those people, a lot of chat today about Sean Stevenson, whether or not he's going to go and play in the NRL with the Dolphins, that's the word. We have him on the show, we'll give you the answers, we'll investigate these topics and find out what's going on. We'll also have a chat about the Women's Rugby World Cup and of course the NPC final as well. So before we carry on, of course, James Parsons in studio, Bryn Hall in Japan. Guys, we're going to have a third North Harbour person on the show. <laughs> Third, aren't you, honorary? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I've spent so much time talking about it. Certainly, know your players better than the county's players. <laughs> um, so, before we get to Sean Stevenson, and I'm sure you guys have got plenty that you want to know from Sean Stevenson. Um, although we're going to have to let you go know, before Sean comes along. I'm devastated. Any chance to talk in our round? I'm missing my opportunity. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, Jip has got a few other things to get to. Um, Women's Rugby World Cup. We had another really yeah. interesting weekend in the game. England versus France. And there was one stark thing that stood out for me that marks England apart from all the other teams. And it's a massive thing in rugby. Territory. They are probably the only right. team that can effectively play territory jipper. And to me, that says they're unstoppable. And it was the difference between them winning and losing that game. They probably didn't perform as well as they would have liked. Um, but because they played down the right end of the park, yeah, they might not have executed and scored as many points, but they still got the job done. And, and I've been reading a few articles f from their local um, newspapers back up, up north, and, man, they're, they're pretty brutal. Like, they're like, oh, the cracks are starting to show. But I think with the intensity, I mean, there was even a few scraps. It was, um, it was, a, it was a, a great, great test match and a, and a sign of things to come when we get into these knockout stages of of how, how tight these fixtures are going to be. What's it out for you, Brent? Yeah, I think it's just that. I think the probably the execution side of it is one thing they'll want to clean up and knowing that, you know, they probably left a few points out there. But yeah, it's the it's the kicking stats. You know, England had thirty three kicks and, you know, France had thirty one. France tried to obviously play the kick battle with, with England, but you know, a few aimless kicks here and there was probably the difference when it came to the kicking um, with England, you know, Harrison if they feel like they're going nowhere, um, they've got the opportunity then to be able to put it back into the pocket. And she's got a very good kicking game, whether it be long or contestable, and then being able to have that line defense, which, um, you know, both teams showed some pretty good defensive um, systems. Uh, you know, it was only 13 7, and, um, you know, there's a lot of physical breakdowns as well. So, you know, that's one thing that I think the Black Ferns will have to look. Um, no doubt they'll be looking forward to Scotland in the first stages. But, um, you know, the New Zealand team are the complete opposite. You know, they only have, you know, single figure um, digits of kicking, you know what I mean? So, um, it's going to be a battle of contrasts of styles when, when if it does come to that. But you know, England, um, they're still going to be tough. You know, they probably didn't think they played to their um, expectation, but you know, their kicking game is going to be one massive difference coming forward in these uh, later parts of this World Cup. I think the French can't be knocked out either. Like they lost the, arguably their two best players um, early on in the first quarter, and that changes the whole dynamic. Especially that eight nine combo, as you'd know, Bryn, is quite crucial to you know sort of that strike attack. Um, off, off set piece, but also, you know, maybe the accuracy of the kicking game um, coming from nine, and, and we know how effective they are. But I mean, I know they've got a one-two punch, but Sanzus is, is is preferred. So, it's it's more for me is does it damage them too much? But you'd have to say based on the stats and where they got to to being within reaching distance of winning. Um, it's. It, I still think they're a real threat, and they might even grow from uh, some actual belief from that, and and be able to, you know, go all the way themselves. The defence certainly was very, very good. They managed to contain England in a lot of ways, but the composure of the English Bryn, it, it seemed, you know, it was a big game. It was the most important game of pool play, and they were composed mm. and they got there. Yeah, they were, and I think that's that shows the good signs of a great team, and you know probably the reason why they've won so t test matches consecutively. Um, you know, a lot of those test matches they probably haven't been tested, but you know on the weekend you could think the occasion playing France, they've played them a lot in the Six Nations, but you know in a World Cup situation where 
France were in their game and, you know, if one or two things went their way and they got it right, um, you know, that result could have gone the other way. But, you know, with this England team at the moment, um, they find ways to win and that's that's the sign of a good team. You win ugly and, um, you know, they did that on the weekend and they'll be able to um, you know, get the review and hopefully continue to improve on that performance on the weekend. If we're looking specifically at the Black Ferns, though, against in England, they will need to be getting it out nine times out of ten because if they can take um, the Black Ferns from set piece to set piece, that's going to play into their hands. But on the flip side, if they don't get it out, the the attacking mindset, you know, even leaving nothing out there from what we're seeing with the Black Ferns, if that continues, their chase will and, and their defensive line will have to be pretty sharp because there's some serious weapons in that Black Ferns back three. You know, even in the midfield now, you know, Fitzpatrick and Brunt, like, the, the energy and the explosive power they have, um, you know, if that's coming from deep, even if it's, you know, a couple of phases, yes, they might not have to kick, protect that kicked area, so they'll be able to have more bodies in the defensive line um, because they know Black Ferns are just going to run. But they've still got to make the tackles on some pretty impressive athletes, which, you know, e even though there isn't a kick strategy, that may be just what they've said, like that's what we're going for. Well, that's what we need to have a crack at. And that counter is very much Wayne, in Wayne Smith's arc, you know, like he, he's big on that 15, 20 seconds from a turnover and or counter attack, you can really make a difference and, and have a crack at an attack. Um, but they will have to tidy up their breakdown and, and scrum probably more so than their line out. Um, but the line out more, you know, same sort of things we've spoken about. Um, and probably leads towards this week of needing to pick the top 23 to make sure they can get that, um, you know, that cohesion together so that they can at least get parity in those areas. They don't need to win those yeah. areas, they just need parity so that they can you know, make, make hay while the sun shines in the areas that they're really good at. The attacking kicks early on were really great. You know, DeMont put a little, little grubber through behind that kind of uh, middle of the field where there's, no, uh, there's nobody there and then obviously they saw the pitches around the crossfield kicks and did that a few times as well. Um, so, like, it's good to see that knowing that England, you know, they are going to bring a good defensive system in line to that they do have the opportunity to be able to use those attacking kicking games. But I think, I think they just still need to have the opportunity to be able to have that kicking phase because I think with England, if they're going to do contestables off 10 or kick long and we don't kick it back, you know, and they set a good 14, 13 um, defensive line and we can't go through got to be able to have a kicking game. So whether they're um, just going to throw it throw it around and have a really good execution and be very disciplined around their breakdown and execution of their skill set, um, it would just be interesting to see if they do have an opportunity that they might see um, some kicking game, whether that be off DeMont or Hazel Chubik, um, even Renee Holmes and uh, Kendra Coxage as well, who we saw a little bit in the second half with, with your kicking game. Could they get stuck? I mean, we, we, this is a big if. Hypothetically, they're playing England in the final. Is not having a territory kicking game going to be the end of that game? Like, if you're stuck in your 22, you're stuck in your 40. Is is it too big a thing to overcome with pure attacking talent? I, I'd want to. I'd normally, honestly, 10 times out of 10, say yes. But like, like I mentioned, when they um, played the Wallaroos, they they're so committed to it that they actually piggyback themselves up the field with penalties um, and or line breaks. So I don't think it is said and done, but. It is a very, very bold way to play, um, and especially a side of um, England's ability defensively. I just think if they can't break them down early, England are only going to grow in, in confidence and know that they can just put that ball down there. So maybe it's start with that, but if it's not going to plan, um, you know, we're almost the flip side, in my opinion, of what our kick strategy is, almost kick it straight down the middle and just get a good chase. Don't go to set piece. You just got to keep it away from set piece as much as possible, um, and but still, I, I I think territory needs to occur, but probably not as much as as what I'd normally say, say at, at international male test match level. I, I don't. I I believe after watching a lot of these games that um, it can still win this World Cup. That that mindset. Mm. But if you're all attack and you don't get your Discipline right, Bryn. Yeah. It's even harder, isn't it? And and they haven't got their discipline right. Yeah. Well, that's exactly it. And, you know, if you're an England side or even a French side, like we saw in the Northern Hemisphere Tour, they're just going to take them to set piece, whether that be through the line-out mall, 
Um, the French had some really good pay when they played the Black Ferns, um, being able to score off that with their nines roving in and around, being able to take that short side. But at scrum time as well, you look at Wales and their ability to be able to be real dominant um, in the scrum time in the first half especially. Um, if you don't get your discipline right, you're just giving teams opportunities to be able to take you to set piece. And that's unfortunately a little bit of an Achilles heel for us at the moment. So I saw, you know, Wayne Smith talk about that in the in the stuff article around, you know, their discipline was shocking and they've got to improve that because you can get away with that in Wales and even the Wallaroos, I, I think. But, you know, when we're going to get to the stages of playing in England and the French side, the more times that we don't let them go to set piece, it sets us up much better being able to win those test matches. If we can get parity at set piece, our phase play D has actually stood up. Because if you think about against the Wallaroos, what was it, 11 penalties in 46 minutes, and they're going to the corner, and it's actually you know withstood. Um, they obviously from that quick tap scored wide. Then there was an intercept. But other than that, Wales was the same. I think it was nine penalties in the first half, and then eight in the second, 17 all up. They had ample opportunity to go down there, which they did, but they didn't come away with as many points as they should have. England and France aren't going to allow that. They will make hay while the sun shines. If, if we let them go from kicking to corners and mauling, um, it, it's, it just makes it a tough, much tougher task. So discipline, yes, is going to be crucial in, in you know, giving them the best opportunity to win this World Cup. And before we move on, the 23, you mentioned it earlier, what should be the top 23? They need to play their top team. Let's look at some key positions. The midfield yeah, that's and tough. the loose forwards. Where do you see the top selections? Um, well, if you start with the midfield, um, has Sylvia Brunt pushed her way into a starting team? Potentially. Like, I thought she was great off the bench, but she does have that ability to play that 23 role. Um, you know... Flula was outstanding, so I don't know if she can get pushed out. So it's who plays in that 12 role. Um, and, I, and I think defensively, Flula is, is a good fit. So I think she starts. I, I just don't know who that 12 is at the moment. Um, and Lucy's, uh, I think, you know, if Mikhail Tu is there, McMenamin and then um, Helene is, is probably your, your... But Bremner's in there now. Like she was so strong. On that left flank, how to edge really well. Um, the other one is Locke. I, I think Ruse really played herself into contention to start. Um, and and I, I think a lot of that will be around, you know, getting the biggest bodies there to stop set piece, set piece pressure. And then props, another one, Murray was outstanding off the bench coming back from injury. So I think she's pushed herself in there to definitely be in the 23, just what number. Mm. What about the back three, Bryn? We saw Ruby Tui at fullback, mm. which was probably another example of the fact that they don't really want to kick. Um, so, what do you see the back three looking like? Well, it's pretty par- it's pretty hard to go past, you know, um, obviously Portia Woodman's Portia Woodman starting, obviously, and then Ruby Tui, obviously, you can play on the wing. But then you've got Lithia Anger as well, who's probably one of the best performing wingers, um, you know, with her time and playing the Wallaroos and even in the Northern Hemisphere Tour. So I'll probably go, if they're going to pick Ruby Tui and they're not going to have that kicking game with Renee Holmes, and obviously Hazel Tuber could kick a little bit better, you'd like to think that they'd have Tui, Port Woodman and Letienga on the wings. So that would be my uh, my back three. But if you want more of a kicking game, you've got obviously Renee Holmes or Hazel Tuber, but that would be my back three. Just not sure if Letienga is back from injury. Mm. I think that would be their preferred back three. Maybe we they know something we don't. And that may be the back three going um, into Scotland and, she, and she's fit and available. But I think that's the most elusive. I, I, I just, did you feel, I don't know, I just felt like um, Ruby Tui having that ability to roam from blindside wing to the open side, she might have been more effective on the wing. Mm. She's still really strong at 15, but I, I would hate us to waste that opportunity of just how being that blindside roving winger and because she's so fit and works hard, she is just such a threat on both sides of the field when she's playing that wing. I don't know if fullback gives you that opportunity as much. Yeah. No, I agree. I think if, um, you know, Letiang is not uh, not fit, um, and, you know, that's no, um, obviously, if she's not fit, then I think you go with Woodman and then Ruby Tui for those exact reasons, Jip. You know, the ability that she can rove and she can actually be a great finisher as well. Um, and then you obviously have Hazel Tubik or uh, Renee Holmes who are more accustomed to being at that fullback role. So, mm. um, But yeah, I think more importantly as well, I think Jeb, you're talking around a lot, just got to be able to win our, win our breakdown. 
if we don't win our breakdown, we're not be able to play fast. Um, it's going to fall into the trap of these Northern Hemisphere teams, especially France and England, to be able to suffocate us. And then if we have no kicking game, then it's all based around out and it's out and out attack if we don't get that right. OK. Power rankings after two weeks. Top four. Uh, well, England, France, Black Ferns, um, not the Wallaroos. I don't think they're as convincing. In cup, caught a couple of injuries now. So... Probably, it's probably still, I know Wales got dealt to, but it's probably them sitting fourth. There is, there, there, there is those three and then the rest of the pack, really, mm. at the moment. Italy's there. It's just quite an even, that next five of what the quarterfinals is going to be, it will be quite tight to see how that finishes up, especially with Fiji winning last minute against um, South Africa. Mm. So I'll, I'll go Wales. Well, it's Wales or Wallaroos, one of the two. OK, Bryn? Yeah. Copy and paste, yeah, definitely copy and paste. You've just probably just switched around um, with Wales or even the Wallaroos, but yeah, there's just definitely the top three teams that you know, um, uh, without a doubt, one, two, and three very easily, and then there's a bit of a blanket over the other teams. Yeah, Canada are two from two, but I just don't know if they've had the same competition mm. as the other side have had. Cool, cool. Now, before we move on, we've got Sean Stevenson, remember, coming up on the show to talk about whether or not he is going to go to the NRL. Before we move on, let's talk a little bit of MPC. The final this weekend, Wellington versus Auckland. Everyone's got great memories of that 2000 final with Jonah and Cully, and uh, that was the last time that Wellington won a final. They've got to go to Christchurch, and that in itself is pretty bloody difficult. So the question I'm asking you is, if Wellington can win, why do they win? Um, well, I'll use a semi on the weekend, um, because... They have plenty took the chance to take threes from quite a long range out. And, and I just feel to beat Canterbury at home, you've got to score points. You, you, you've got to get that gap um, early and you've got to take your opportunities. And, and I think if there's ever a side that's informed to score points um, and, and have the right attitude, it'll be them turning down threes and going to the corner and backing themselves. And they've got enough special players, special moves, um, so much artillery in that um, Wellington attack. I think it would be wasted trying to chip away in threes early on. I think you, if, you, if you want to win in Christchurch, you've just got to go after it mm. and go all in. Um, yep. and, and that'll be... And I think Duplessis Karif, he's in that headspace. Like, he's, he's going to win it. He's, he's not going to, you know, sit there and hope that they can hold on tight. And not forgetting that they played the round robin game in Christchurch, and it was really tight up until Dallas McLeod um, intercepted um, a pass in the midfield and, and sort of turned the momentum... Um, Canterbury's way and as Canterbury does in that last 20 they, they did run away with it and I seem to say that a lot um, so it will, it will also rely on the impact of the bench for, for Wellington to make sure that they match the Canterbury impact because Canterbury man it's like that 60 minute mark hits and it's just like everything goes up a gear mm. so it is really crucial that um, Wellington find a way to, to match that. That All Blacks 15 pack. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> tell you what, you, the try um, Burke scored, um, I think it was Poi Hippie made that break. You watch where McAllister came from. He'd cleaned the ruck. It went out here to Poi Hippie. McAllister pins his ears, gets in support, and obviously was the key link for Burke to score. Um, I felt he made a massive statement that, that he is right up there as next cab off the rank um, at, in terms of that hooking spot. Um, so I, I, was, I was really impressed. I was looking forward to that battle between Eklund and um, McAllister and um, you know, there was some impressive plays from both of them but that, that really stood out to me because that was about the 60th minute. You know? like he, he, he was getting through his work and then to see that reaction and the speed off the mark still late in the piece like that, mm. pretty impressive. What do you think, Bryn? Do you think Wellington have got it? Oh, I think they do. I think they've um, shown in probably the last two, the last two games that you know they've got the ability to be able to score points. And I think having a guy like TJ Peronata for for this week is going to be really, really valuable for that group. Um, he's had success actually winning down in Christchurch and knowing what that's look, what that's looked like. And I think, you know, unfortunately, I think Bay of Plenty uh, with um, Fadanui not being able to get those um, accumulate those points really. I guess let off the pressure, not being able to have that scoreboard pressure. But I think, you know, with Wellington, if they can get it right, they've got the ability to be able to score a lot of points. So defensively, you know, Canterbury will probably think we've got to be on the job here and really, um, really good around the defensive system because also as well, having Tamani Allison in that coaching environment, knowing what it is 
to be down in that environment and what it takes to be able to win a game down there, knowing what that kind of preview and review are looking like because, you know, Canterbury and the Crusaders pretty much copy and paste around their game plan and how they run things down there. But, um, again, it's going to be a tough task because, you know, I think I saw a stat, I think they've only lost one finals game down in Christchurch when it comes to a final. So, um, but if there's ever a time... You know, this Wellington team's gone really well. And I think having TJ Pedernada and the way that he can um, influence the game and being able to know big pressures what it looks like is going to give them a lot of confidence um, going in for this final. Wellington are going to need all of their 90-plus uh, percent tackle percentage as well. Because the thing with mm. Canterbury, it's never flash moves or anything. They're just relentless. They will just keep building phase after phase and then they just they wear you down. Um, so that, that battle and, and Wellington living up to the defensive statistics they finished the comp. I think they finished round robin in first place, um, and that was in percentage, but also turnovers. So they're, they're really dangerous from that turnover attack, but Canterbury are second. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a fitting final, obviously, but um, it's just that that arm wrestle and just hanging in there. Like, they may not get the reward if they go to the corner, but the pressure's built, you're sucking energy out. You know, it'll eventually come, and, and not getting deflated if it isn't, you know, a big score line or, um, you know, when the game's in the balance, just keeping keeping in their systems, trusting themselves for those long periods of time. Um, it, it's, it, I mean, it's not easy. One loss, Crusaders, how many? I don't even think they've lost down there in a final. So it is a tough place to go. Yeah. Better time of year to go. I though. think it's the challenge. The challenge will be definitely that last 20 minutes, I think. Um, you know, you look at the the rankings. I think Canterbury in the last in the last twenty minutes are the best in the comp at scoring points, mm. and so it's because they've just they've got a great amount of depth in that group. You know, you can bring guys on that are you know experienced Super Rugby campaigners. You know, obviously you've Luke Romano and throughout the season, you can bring on who's all has all that experience. So, and you've got Willie Hines or Mitchell, Mitchell Drummond as well. So the experience that they have in that last twenty minutes is very 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 good. So, um, you know, if the game's in the balance, you know. The ability that Wellington just need to have that ability to just stay on, stay on with everything, whether that be line out more, uh, a scrum penalty and a big moment in a game. It's just having the ability to stay on in those moments. And so they've got enough leadership around that group, I think, in Wellington to really um, to be able to do that. But again, it's easier said than done doing it down in Christchurch in the final. Um, it's pretty tough. 22 years since Jonah scored that famous try in the final when they won in 2000. One of the great tries was he 60, 70 metres out? Vunenbaka, who had all of that pace. Was and coming a big body. And a big body, yeah, with the big shaft like It wasn't like a big man on small man. No, and he swatted him off four or five times and scored in the corner. One of the great all-time tries, not just in the NPC finals, but in the NPC of all time. Of all time. Of all time. Of all time. What's your favourite NPC final moment? Oh, I was thinking about this, like, naturally... I'll always lean towards 94, obviously Harbo making the final. So, <laughs> just, like, just a big fight was yeah, your Yeah, yeah, just, just a good <laughs> brawl that we didn't, you know, obviously beating them in the round robin and not being able to do it at home in the final was disappointing. But there's that. But I, I suppose for me, like growing up, is, um, I don't know if you remember the Otago team of 98. Um, and I just thought one of the most entertaining teams. You had Brendan Laney who would score and he'd start the chainsaw going. You had Goldie who was there just doing freakish things. And then... Romy Ropati, and I, every time he scored, he'd kick his foot, I don't know how high, sign his name, like he was, I don't know, they were just true entertainers mm -hmm. that season, and, and they, they played that way um, throughout until the final, and, and was, was so clinical, and um, it was infectious to watch. Yeah, yeah, what about for you, Bryn? Oh, I think we'll start off with Harbour, us winning that final, which was which wasn't a final, but it was great to be um, have those memories, but I guess for me, it was actually Taranaki and Tasman, um, you know, about a decade ago when you had Jameson Gibson Park and James Lowe playing for Tasman and Taranaki. I just remember that final in New Plymouth and actually watching the scenes of how much it meant to that um, Taranaki side and I guess the, the, the community down there and the scenes of obviously um, a full packed out Yarrow Stadium, which was there at the time. Um, so, yeah, that's one of my biggest memories, watching that game and seeing how much it meant to a community like Taranaki and really getting behind and showing what it is at provincial rugby when you get down to those small communities and how much it means to them. Mm, that was the big underdog final, wasn't it? That was the changing of face of the NPC. For a few years, suddenly it wasn't Auckland and Canterbury. You know, I was going to say Wellington, but really, like Wellington only feature <laughs> big time every 10 years yeah, or so. I think it was a bold call uh, bringing up the championship when we were trying to talk about the premiership. <laughs> <laughs> I love your yeah. work, brother. One of the great. It was a hell of a drop goal. Thanks, it was a hell of a drop goal from Getz. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. So cool. They were very, very cool. We'll find out soon, maybe.
from Sean Stevenson as well what his favourite was. But in the meantime, we've got a big goodbye to you, Jipper. You've got big stuff that you get paid for well <laughs> because we give you... I'm just replacing hats. So yeah. I'll just get another hat on. <laughs> so we've got to say goodbye to you. We'll say hello to Sean Stevenson in just a moment. So thanks. Cheers, mate. It would be a bit of a punish, wouldn't it, having three Harbour people on the show all at once. So <laughs> having Jipper go, we'll say goodbye to him. Sean Stevenson, uh, North Harbour, Chiefs, Marty All Blacks, welcome onto the show, mate. We were having a look at some of your stats for the season in the NBC, and it makes pretty impressive reasoning, uh, reading. You know, let me blow some smoke up your ass just for a second or two. Um, first in carries, uh, this is through the round robin, 130. Third in metres made, 103. Um, you know, fifth in defenders beaten. Um, you're in all of the top 10 stats in attack and your D stats as well at 88%. Mate, you must have been pretty happy with how that season um, shaped up for you, even if you guys didn't quite make it through. Yeah, we... Um, obviously, nice to uh, get some stats uh, thrown, a, thrown around about you, but, um, yeah, obviously, <laughs> uh, good season. Pretty disappointing that um, we didn't quite get through the quarterfinal final stage, but... Um, yeah, no, we uh, we probably had a slow start um, the first couple of rounds, and then um, we shifted into gear. So um, that was just nice. We had a um, you know a pretty awesome team. It was, it was very young, um, but um, we managed to do it, what we did, and um, you know throw the ball around. And um, you know, I hope the Harvard fans uh, enjoyed our style, our play our style of rugby. So um, that was good. Yeah, just on that, Sean, I think, um, mate, having the likes of Tavita, Tavita Lee coming back, who was in great form, and I think, um, you know, Mark Talia, who came back from Tasman Marker, who poached him and stole him from us for two years, but he um, he came back and looked like he was awesome, and you you guys were obviously arguably the best back three in the comp. What was the conversation throughout the year for you three? Because you guys were so pivotal in that great season for North Harbour this year. <laughs> to be honest, mate, um... There was just a lot of jokes going on between the three of us. Like, yeah, we don't really talk about too much about footy. So, um, yeah, we like, like, yeah, you, Brenda, you know, us three boys, we like to have a bit of a joke and a bit of a laugh. And, mm. um, you know, so we've had a few things um, where we've been doing our jobs. So, um, no, we just, to be honest, mate, we just, we just um, play footy. Like, we just played eyes on footy. And um, I think when we're all on, like, it's, it's easy for us to, um, you know, make those breaks or break the footers or draw those players in to be just scoring a hat, a hat trick every game, you know. So, um, you know, even once, you know, it crept our whole back line and, um, you know, we had players all over the park that made it, um, our jobs a lot easier. So, um, you yeah, know, it's also that cliche, you know, um, <coughs> other boys doing their jobs, but it's um, it's as simple as that, you know, boys doing their jobs uh, makes other boys look good. Just with your, with your, Form this year, bro. Like, obviously, you have been really lucky to be able to play with you and have come through when you were younger through Auckland Grammar, and then you obviously went to Waikato early with the Chiefs. But then, for whatever reason, the last 12 months, you've just been a lot more consistent with your footy. Has there been anything different that you've done within the last 12 months that, because whether it be with the Chiefs, the, the New Zealand Moldies, I don't know, you were outstanding, and then you brought into that form for North Harbour. What's been the difference and change of your preparation, maybe, with how you played so well? Oh, look, like, obviously, I care. Um, but I think, you know, you get to an age where you kind of just break the jackals off and um, that care factor of what people think and, um, mm. you know, you're, I guess, scared of making mistakes. Um, you know, kind of just, you know, you get to the age where you just kind of break all those jackals off and um, that's what I felt like I've done this year, you know. I, obviously, I do care, but obviously, you know, play with a bit more freedom, which, um, you know, the last 12 months has probably shown that I have been playing with a lot more freedom and um, mm. I always get told that, that word of consistency, you know, like probably haven't um, had consistent game time, but um, I feel like the last 12 months, what I've done in those games, it has been consistent um, footy and, um, mm. you know, a lot has been talking about my defence, which um, was a big work on for me this year and I felt like I've um, really... Uh, <laughs> stepped up in that in that um, facet of play so um, yeah I've been pretty happy with my play the last 12 months so yeah just that freedom I guess Seven mm. turnovers too mate like that's almost matching your career tally is it? Yeah I'm not, I'm not scared to tell the list what's how many jackals I've got this season so um, <laughs> yeah I'll, uh, I'll take those seven <laughs> You came into the Chiefs as an 18 year old like you were a kid when you first started you've been around for seven years now in pro footy and you're only 25 
you must have learned some pretty serious lessons along the way, you know, essentially having been thrown in the deep end. Was, was that a difficult process to get to where you are now from, you know, being a high school kid playing super rugby, essentially? Yeah, I guess um, I guess it was pretty daunting. But um, when I first went down there, I had a meeting with Dave Rennie and Andrew Strawbridge. Those are the, those are the guys that got me down there. And um, I probably don't, you know, I probably had the potential to, um, you know, rip into it straight away. And um, I guess it comes back to Brenner's point about why I've been playing um, good for the last 12 months. It's kind of, it's just been that, play, that freedom, I guess. You know, I've always... Um, Showing in and out of um, games and stuff like that, but that consistency where it always comes about, about you know, um, coming from an 18 year old, you know, you had all the skills and stuff like that, um, but it was just that consistent, um, consistent game time, I guess, in terms of um, actually showing that. So, um, mm. yeah, it was obviously daunting, but um, you know, obviously, you learn a lot in those well, well it's coming up to my eighth and ninth season now, so um, yeah, still feel old, but still young at heart. Just on that as well, bro, because I think, yeah, look, your your form's been outstanding. I think, you know, you've been warranted selection, I think, arguably for the All Blacks or even the All Blacks 15 that's just been named. Um, for a guy that's obviously been through your situation, obviously playing consistent footy and, you know, not getting the rub of the green or being in select in those squads, what was your mindset when you missed out on that on that All Blacks 15, obviously with your form and how, and how you were going? Is, were there any conversations from the All Black coaches or the coaches at the, um, at the All Blacks 15 level around your missing out on selection? Um, yeah, obviously, it was pretty gutted. Um, you know, there's, uh, I think, a lot of other boys um, probably are in the, in the reckoning to be in that, in that team. And, um, yeah, I like obviously gutted, but um, no, nah, I didn't have any feedback or communication at all um, into why I didn't make it. Um, so I guess it was just one of those things where um, you could either dwell on it for a, a week or two and um, let it bring you down, or you just um, you know move on and um, have it in the back of your head in terms of, you know, um, but, you know, what's the next best thing for me? And um, yeah, so um, yeah, I guess that's one of those um, things, bro. You've been, you've, you've had that done to you before. You know, you've been um, close to it and um, gone through it. So um, I'd like to come talk about uh, how you handle it. Were you surprised? Oh, um, oh, oh, I guess you know a little bit, um, but uh, that's what he. You, don't, you know, you're, you're not the ones that are selecting the team and whatnot. And, um, yeah, just got to gotta move on. And, um, yeah, like I said, just uh, put your head down and get back into your work. Um, obviously, mate, we are big advocates for NRL in, in um, this podcast. We love the NRL. Chipper has his segments. He wants segments to obviously be about the NRL. And, you know, fortunately, there's been a lot of rumours around, um, you know, whether it be with the Dolphins or other NRL teams, because you've got a great skill set to be able to fit into that. Um, are those rumours anything to be to be taken seriously, or is it a genuine option that you're thinking of possibly, you know, seeing other options as well and, uh, and another coach? Um, no, to be honest, mate, I've, um, I've still got one more year with the Chiefs. Uh, so, um, yeah, at the moment I'm just focusing on that. So, um, yeah, that's all I can say at the moment. Do you actually see it as a viable option going into league once that contract finishes and actually having that as a genuine option post that 2023 with the last year with the Chiefs? Oh, yeah, I think, um, you know, like, like you said right now, like, um, I think there's about 20 of us, 24 of us boys at um, Chiefs this year that are playing the NRL fantasy. So um, it's one <laughs> of those uh, sports that you, uh, that you obviously, you know, um, would love to give a crack or like, have a crack at it. And, um, yeah, I guess um, it is an option. Um yeah, you know, after 2023, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. So I guess it's always what, been one of those things for me where, um, like you said, like my school said, I feel like um, would suit it in a way, and obviously playing touch and tag back in, mm. back in uh, the school days, um, uh, similar to that. And um, yeah, it's just one of those things that um, yeah, quite a few boys always want to give it a crack, but um, they talk about it but never do. So um, yeah, never say never. So, awesome. can, can you clarify? Have you been approached by the Dolphins? Have you had discussions with them? Yeah, I've had a chat. Um, you know, that's obviously for for uh, after twenty twenty three. So, um, yeah, I, I had a call from Wayne, but um, yeah. So that's Wayne Bennett. Yeah. What's it like getting a phone call from Wayne Bennett? Unreal. Unreal. Oh, I mean. Um, 
pretty nerve wracking. This is probably the, arguably the best American <laughs> uh, well, lead coach uh, in this generation. So, um, yeah, that no, was obviously yeah. uh, a bit daunting, but um, that was cool. Just uh, chew the yeah. fat. Yeah, it's good to, you know, have a, have a chat with the goat, I guess. What did he want to know about you? Oh, just, um, you know, what do I, <laughs> what I've been up to? And, yeah, I guess it's talking footy, really. What position would you want to play? You know, do you have a preference of, because you can play fullback, you know, you've obviously dabbled in with a little bit of number 10 at Mighty 10 Cup level, Bunnings NPC level. What position would you like to play if you did have a um, cross codes? I'd like to say fullback or a running six, something like that, use my boot as well. Um, mm. But yeah, somewhere, some, somewhere along those lines. So, But um, yeah, at the moment, just focusing on rugby. So uh, we'll see what happens. And Chipper would kill me if I didn't ask, you know, with the 88% tackle stat and the uh, the dominant nature of the tackles, you could bring something really solid to full back. You know, Chipper's always going on about James Tedesco, isn't he? You know, he's he's dying to see you tackle in the back of a rugby league field. Yeah, you asked me a couple of years, I probably would have had a couple of shoulder reconstructions. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good to get good to get some um, hits on the shoulders and um, actually uh, get some dominant ones, so. I've been getting I've been getting enough uh, crap uh, about my um, defense um, from all the cheese boys like Brody Retallick and stuff like that. So it's uh, good to have some good shots in there. <laughs> okay, so we, we'll leave it at a wait and see then, and move on from the NRL. Is that that's where we need to leave it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Done there. <laughs> Fair well enough. done. Um, do you have a favorite rugby league player? Oh, I think you can't go past Benji. Just what he did on the field, you know, mm. just um, for all Kiwi kids growing up. Moving towards the NPC, you know, you played against um, against Canterbury and Wellington. Both, um, I don't actually know if you didn't play Wellington, but you've obviously seen how they've been playing. Who are you picking? What do you think the, um, you know, who's got the upper route, who's got the upper hand in, in that final? How do you think it's going to go? Oh, I think um, it's going to be a good game, to be honest. I think Wellington's come a long way, you know, they probably started off slow and um, just, they just started to fall around from everywhere and they've got game game breakers every you know everywhere through their team so um, I think that's mm. you know they're going to um, throw everything at the Cantabs but um, obviously Cantabs at home you know classic saying you know they've had that finals um, footy um, through their blood so um, I don't know it's going to be close I reckon um, but I'll probably um, I'll probably pick from when Wellington played Canterbury last I think um, Wellington's definitely got a lot a lot better since then, and um, I think I think they um, they win it in the close one. That Wellington attacking structure is pretty crazy, isn't it? Like they they have momentum and they've got weapons. Um, how do you think Canterbury shut down the, those weapons? Oh, I think they're just going to go um, probably depending on what the what the wind's doing down there. You know, probably go back to the aerial game and um, just slow down all the momentum because um, obviously ball in hand for Wellington is where they're, they're dangerous at. So. Uh, just putting all the pressure on um, on Wellington to, um, you know, I guess, force them to play and um, probably scoreboard, scoreboard pressure, taking the threes and um, accumulating the points. And then um, ex- you know, classic uh, saying of just exiting well and getting down there, I think that's probably the best way that, you know, that's how Canterbury play. So, and, you know, Canterbury always, <coughs> uh, but, you know, they're not scared of throwing the ball around either. So, um, yeah, should be should be a cracky game. Nice, nice. Before we let you go, what's the off-season got in store for you? Bit of a holiday? Yeah, a bit of a holiday. Um, see what see what most of the boys are doing. Obviously, you know, some boys are getting away. And, um, yeah, try to get away. Might go back to um, some more where my mum's from. I've been since 2009, so um, might head over there and just catch up with family. But, yeah, see what happens. Oh, well, mate, you enjoy it, Shirley. You've had an awesome season, mate. A very well deserved rest and in a few uh, a few alcoholic beverages at festivals, yeah. <laughs> I'm imagining that Brenner is uh, a big rhythm and vines, got to get on the dance floor kind of guy. Uh, does he have good moves? No, nah, he's the best. <laughs> he's, he's real stuff. <laughs> but he's got he's got good chat. He's got good chat. But uh, yeah, he's stuff. He's stuff. So. Um, Awesome, mate. Hey, well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. and Enjoy your time off. No, cheers, team. Thank you very much. And um, go well for your season in uh, Japan, eh, mate? Well, not quite going to the NRL, Bryn, but, you know, 
that he's had the conversation. Oh, he has. And look, I think, um, you know, it's good for him to be able to, you know, we're players, you know, we're players and we have to, um, you know, put ourselves out there and, you know, having that story out there with, you know, whether he was going to go to the Dolphins and from what we heard from Sean, you know, he was able to talk to Wayne Bennett, which would have been an amazing call to have that opportunity to talk to one of the greatest coaches of all time. So, um, yeah, it looks like maybe possibly 2023. Um, the Chiefs are very lucky. New Zealand rugby, I think, are lucky to still have him in, still have him around for another year. And, you know, bar an injury and then some more consistency of playing some really good rugby for another 12 months, who's to say that he won't be in that World Cup squad or even the All Blacks 15 moving forward? Yeah, I suppose it's one of those things that you want to give yourself the chance, right? You look back in years to come and go, what if? I might have missed the All Blacks 15. I might have missed the All Blacks, but what if? Well, that's it. And, you know, he's still young. You know, even, you know, you talked about it, Ross. You know, he came in at an 18-year-old, but he seems, you know, that he's been around for so long that you'd think he'd be 28, 29 with how many years he's played professionally in New Zealand. But, um, yeah, I think it gives him another 12 months to, to hopefully crack it and get again with that consistency playing really well like he has the last 12 months. And then, you know, 26 has the opportunity again to go play for the Dolphins or NRL team, and he's got the skill set to be able to do that. And, um, you know, it would be great to see... Uh, something different you know you never see really New Zealand rugby players go and play um, rugby league we talked about TJ Peranata a few years ago that he was thinking about maybe going to the Roosters post Japan um, but yeah he's one guy that I think would fit in really nicely in a league environment yeah, it would be interesting to see what he'd get up to I suppose he's bringing in the experience of being a pro footy player so as we've seen with people like Roger Tuivasa Sheik you you can mm. adapt you know because mm. you've got that professional mindset and you know how to learn in a professional environment there's not too dissimilar yeah, it is, and like it is a different game, and I think there are difficult, um, you know, the different physical um, physical requirements that you will need in fitness when it comes to rugby league. But you know, look, what's you know what's to stop someone from a challenge and something different, you know? And I can imagine the money would be uh, enticing as well. I think they do in a, a little bit more money over in the NRL. So you know, what a great opportunity! You know, he'd be still be twenty six if he went over there, signed a one year deal, came back, didn't work out. Um, the experience of playing, you know, in our environment, and then you know, coming back to play rugby and possibly even going to Japan or overseas, or trying to come back to New Zealand and play some some rugby in New Zealand. We'll wait and see. The story will be around next year. We'll wait until contract time. <laughs> That's it, man. We tried. We tried, Ross, but no, he, he was very well. <laughs> Get some good PR lessons from the Chiefs. Yeah, yeah, so he definitely did. Well. He definitely he left a few through to the yeah. keeper. He, he did bat at a couple. Yeah, but, yeah, fair enough. He hey, hey, mate, well, thank you very much again for today. I'll see you again next week. We can talk a little bit about what happened in the NBC final, obviously the Women's World Cup, and look forward to the All Blacks and All Blacks 15 tours that are coming up. So, uh, cheers, mate. Go well. We'll see you then. Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimasu. <laughs> and thank you very much for catching us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Remember, do not miss the NBC final this weekend. Canterbury versus Wellington. It should be an absolute ripper. Matewa.